So let's see. How about a couple of things that I wanted to talk about. Um, some events for CPU measurement, which uh, will affect the way that you analyze your code. Um, I wanted to say briefly uh, some things about the OpenMP tools interface, which we're actually using on Cori and can improve your experience, but it's, it's still a bit of a work in progress. I wanted to show you a, a key technique for understanding performance that you can use on either CPUs or GPUs. We use differential performance analysis. Um, third, uh, I wanted to talk about kernel sampling just a bit because if you don't use it, then, or your system isn't configured with it, then all the tools will lie to you. And then um, finally, something about context recycling for dynamic threads, because I think we may have run across this in one of the applications we're working with this week. Okay, so first, um, there are a couple of different ways that you can time things on the CPU. If you just say HPC run, and you don't give it any arguments to say, what events you want to monitor, then the default event is CPU time. And so that's the best for analysis of profile data. So when you run uh, a, an application on a system like Cori or Summit, um, an MPI application, it often has a helper thread that's running a progress engine. And if you measure with real time, then what you're going to get is a, it, it will seem like the helper thread for the progress engine is running hard and taking up a significant fraction of your execution time. That's not really true. What happens is the progress engine will sit there and wait the majority of the time and it'll spend its time blocked in a system call. If you monitor things with real time, then every time a, a timer goes off. So if we set up real time, the default is, is maybe 300 times a second. Um, so if uh, you monitor with real time, it's going to repeatedly interrupt your application and say, where are you now? And it'll, and it'll say, I'm at the system call. And it'll look like it's active at the system call, but the only reason it's active is because we woke the thread by probing it with a real time signal. If you instead measure with CPU time, then you won't wake the application, it'll just remain slumbering. However, the last sample that you got before it blocked might be from somewhere completely different. So you don't have any idea where it blocked. So my advice is if you're tracing and you wanna know sort of where you're at, real time gives you better traces. The, what, what I mean by better traces means that if you're blocked at a system call, you'll have, um, call paths shown in the window that, that show that you're blocked in the system call. If you use CPU time, then in the traces, you may have something that looks misleading because the last time we were able to sample the process, the last time it was running, it may not have been at the point where it's blocked right now. So that's just a, a caution that real time is better for the traces, but CPU time is better for analyzing the profile data. John, I, so I have a quick question. Uh, yes, go ahead. When it when it blocks the, I mean, when it activates the block thread, when it goes back, does it go back into the system call or does it go back into the program? And if the program expected, hey, I, I should only unblock when I have something, you know, will it get messed up? So that's an excellent question. Um, normally, what what we say is we want to restart the system calls, and so in general, if you're in a system call like read or something. Um, and you get woken up, then the system call will just get restarted. There are certain system calls that don't automatically restart. Um, one example is poll. I think uh, another example is, is select. Mark, can you think of any? Uh, poll and select are the two classic uh, syscalls that don't automatically restart. There's also sort of the issue of, um, you know, some code that doesn't handle e interrupted uh, correctly. So like this, um, this thing with the cross process, uh, a cross process memory, something that we saw 
Uh, it, it had a problem because it was a third party kernel driver and it basically didn't handle the automatic restart correctly. So Rishi, the, the answer is that in most cases, if the code is well written and it can handle the fact that it's being profiled, that there, there may be, e, your, your code may see e interrupted calls. Um, but if we, we did find that there was, there was a case where with the Cray XPMEM driver, which is used for fast inter-process communication, if we interrupted it while it was in the middle of XPMEM open, um, it didn't return e interrupted. It just returned as if it succeeded, and that it, it actually hadn't. And so yeah. we have a couple. We have a couple of workarounds inside H P C Toolkit where we know that that is a bug, and Cray hasn't fixed it. And so we end up saying, well, for that case, we're just going to manually retry and see if we can sort of force X P M M to open. Okay. In right. other cases, with, with let me finish here for a second. So. With select and poll, we actually have wrappers in HPC Toolkit where we will reinitiate the, the call since we can't just automatically restart it. Okay, so we sort of hide the fact that it's been interrupted from you and that the system doesn't automatically restart it. Our tool catches it and then restarts it. Okay, go ahead. Well, I was going to say the one case that I could see being problematic and it probably rarely would ever happen is if you're trying to do an end map and uh, you can't get the kernel pages and you interrupt right in the middle of that, it'll probably return, hey, I couldn't do it. And then your program will probably say, well, I guess there's no memory. I, I think that it, it will return probably a return. I haven't looked at the MMAP return codes, but it, it should return E interrupted. And if your code is, is well-written, um, then it should say, okay, I'll try again. Otherwise, um, you know, the code is not friendly to profilers and there's not so much we can do about that. I, I just Other see code doing that a lot, which is they say, and map me this thing. And if I get a null, that means there was no memory. So I quit. Um, so I would have to look at that case to see what, uh, what happens with, with MMAP. Okay, so these are some, some general rules of thumb. I mean, you can use CPU time if you don't want to interrupt um, the, the system calls. And so that's that's safe, okay? All right, so besides the Linux timers, there's also other things that you can measure on the CPU. So there's the Linux perf event monitoring subsystem. And so this supports using hardware counters. So you can measure things like um, cycles, instructions, um, cache misses. And then there's some software counters for measuring things like context switches and page faults. And so um, perf has been stand, a standard part of the Linux kernel since 2631. And so I think that on almost all systems that you're using, you should be able to use perf. So um, there's a, a pretty good document that I came across when um, looking around for materials with, with this talk, um, where this explains you know, some, some events that you can monitor with perf and it has some, some explanations and some examples. So, just to give you a, a sense, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but just to give you a sense of the, the kinds of things you can measure. So perf has um, a set of hardware event counters. So cycles, instructions, cache references, cache misses, branch instructions, um, front end stall. So front end stall means uh, waiting for say the instruction cache. Um, so, so this is like front end that, Front end is, is uh, re related to the, the code and then back end is related to the execution. So um, instruction TLB misses, instruction cache misses end up being front end stalls. And then there's um, the, the CPUs can vary their cycle, vary their frequency. And so you can either measure cycles or reference cycles. And so these, the, the, uh, the time for the regular cycles, can uh, can change based on uh, based on changes to the clock frequency. The reference CPU cycles are are stable. So um, there's also there's there's a bunch of hardware cache events. So you can look at uh, L1 instruction and data cache and last level cache translation look aside buffers, the branch processing unit, and then 
this is a, a general thing that has a bunch of modifiers that you can add to it. And if you look at the document that I referenced on the previous page, that has a bunch of modifiers for this. So you can understand when you're reading and writing in the cache or whether you're prefetching, um, or you can find out when, whether, uh, whether your, your result uh, accessed the data or whether it missed in cache. So um, I'm not going to try and give you a whole tutorial on, on sort of how to use perf. In general, you know, it's, it's a lot about the memory. And so if you, uh, if you monitor your cycles and your instructions to know how many instructions per cycle you're executing and where your cache misses are, your TLB misses, that'll take you a long way. So there's also some software events and we can monitor these as well. And so Perf exports all of these so we can look at page faults and context switches and when threads migrate from core to core um, page faults. So all of these things you can monitor as well. So in order to find out what you can actually monitor, you can say HPC run dash L and it's gonna give you a huge list of things, probably over a hundred. And there's a, there's a few ways that you can name these events. So you can name these events by saying like perf underscore count underscore um, software context switches. Um, but perf also supports some, some shorthand names. So I think you can also just say lowercase context dash switches. And so when you use HPC run dash L, you can see all of these events and their convenient aliases. So for instance, um, this perf count hardware CPU cycles can just be shorthand reference as lowercase cycles. And so it's a lot easier. And if you run HPC run dash L, you'll find out what all the aliases for these events are and what the shorthand is. Now, the other thing that we do is we use, um, we use uh, Pappy. And, and so Pappy supports this uh, syntax where it, the events are named uh, like ix86 architecture. So this is x86 events on, uh, the, and these apply to pretty much all of the processors and so all of the x86 processors. So you can say that colon colon event name. And so if you're interested in x86 events, you can say HPC run dash L and grep for those. The other thing is um, all of the perf events are also available as perf colon colon event name. And this has all the built-in names and you can either refer to them as the long names, like perf colon colon, perf underscore, count underscore, whatever. Um, or you, I think you can also refer to them as like perf colon colon cycles. Why would you add this? Well, if, if you just want to distinguish exactly what you're specifying, you might use this qualifier. But typically, if I'm using perf events, I'm just going to use the shorthand like cycles and instructions. And then, um, for particular processors, they'll have some, some other sets of events like BDW EP, and that's a, like a Broadwell EP specific events. And so these are events that are available on a particular instance of an x86 architecture. So I'm sure that there's some KNL specific events or some Haswell specific events if we look on, on Cori. Um, I mentioned that you can omit the colon colon and you can also specify counter names with lowercase. So when we are using perf events, um, it also supports multiplexing. So the situation is that um, the performance monitoring units in the CPU can support a small fixed number of counters, maybe three or four counters per hardware thread. And if you start to use more than that, then perf events will automatically multiplex them. And so what that means is that any, at any particular time, the number of events being collected won't exceed the number of hardware counters that you have available. So the kernel will partition the events into sets of things that can be measured at the same time, and then it will monitor one set of events for a little while and then switch to another. So for instance, if I said something like um, cycles, instructions, L2 misses, um, TLB misses, and um, L1 accesses, and I want to monitor all of those. Well, it may decide that it can't monitor all of those all of those cache events in one set, and so it might monitor, say, cycles instructions and L1 misses, and then in the other set of events, it has the other um, cache events. 
And so then it'll alternate back and forth between them. And uh, it, so you won't get true counts for exactly what happened during the application. But um, my advice is that the, the multiplexing is fine for sort of casual execution analysis. If, if, if what you're trying to do is count exactly what happened, then probably what you want to do is multiple runs where you'll run using a small number of counters in one run and then a small number of counters in another run and then just analyze the, the databases together. So the counts you get back from multiplexing can give you an idea of what's going on. So obviously if you have TLB problems, it's gonna show up with TLB problems. If you wanna know exactly the number of TLB misses you have, then you wanna measure it in with uh, few enough events so that you're not using multiplexing. Okay. So there are a couple of ways of controlling the sampling frequency for the perf events. So um, the recommended way is automatic. So we use, uh, we use this frequency-based sampling, which samples um, at a, a certain rate per second. And we set that when, uh, when HPC Toolkit is installed, I think the default frequency is 300 times a second on most architectures and on KNL, I think it's, I think it's lowered. Um, I would have to check and see what our default frequency is on KNL. We found that if we're monitoring more than hundred times a second on every hardware thread, then it slows down the program significantly. So the automatic is, is, is very convenient and it's going to um, kind of right size the monitoring so that, uh, so that you're not spending too much time monitoring. Now there's, so there's two options with um, perf events. There's, there's period-based sampling where I can say that I wanna monitor cycles and I wanna monitor say every million cycles and every 5 million instructions. I can just specify a number. Or if I want um, to monitor cycles at a frequency of 100 per second or an instruction at 200 per second, I can use the F modifier to say that I wanna do frequency-based sampling. And then if I want to just sort of change the default frequency for a couple of things I'm monitoring, then there's an option for that too, using this dash C option. So if you look in our, our HPC toolkit manual, there's a, a longer discussion of some of this. So um, in order to measure um, dynamically linked executables, when you launch your program, you can just specify, here's a bunch of perf things I want to measure, cycles, um, context switches, page walk, last level cache misses. Um, if you're using statically linked executables, these are relatively uncommon. It used to be the default on Cray and BlueGene platforms. Then you don't get to use HPC run. You have to actually link our measurement library into your executable with the HPC link utility. Details are in the manual. And then you have to specify, um, then you don't get to use HPC run. You specify the things you want to monitor in an environment variable. So Actually, what happens is HPC run will set the environment variable um, for you. And we use HPC run for dynamically linked applications because it sets the environment variable and preloads the code into the address space. In this case, with statically linked programs, the code's already in the address space because it got put there at compile time. So um, next, I wanted to briefly mention the OpenMP tools interface. This is something that I've been working on for a long time, sort of multiplexed with a lot of other things. And so um, could have been done a long time ago, but we're still working on it because well, it's just mixed in with a bunch of other things. So the issue with OpenMP is that there's a large gap between threaded programming models and their implementations. And so <clears throat> the user level calling context for an, uh, an OpenMP programs and tasks is not readily available. So what happens is when you start an OpenMP program, there's an initial thread. And then um, when you enter a parallel region, it'll start up a bunch of worker threads. And if you look at the, at the call stack for each of these threads, so HPC Toolkit uses call stack unwinding to discover where costs are being incurred. If you unwind the call stack in the worker threads, you'll find that, so here's some OpenMP routine, here's some OpenMP um, code regions that might, parallel loops or, or tasks, and they've been torn out of the application. And then you see them in a calling context that says launch worker, launch thread, invoke task function, task params. And I would argue no one wants to 
analyze their program this way, because you can't tell exactly where these things came from and you don't have a global view of the program. And so the, the problem is that when these activities were launched, we don't know exactly what, par like at, at runtime, we don't know what parallel region these were associated with. We just know some worker thread picked this up and started executing it. And so in order for tools to do a better job, some runtime support is necessary. So the, the challenge that we have is that the tools are just naturally going to see this low level view of the open MP threads. We're going to see the master thread and the worker threads, and, and those are asymmetric. And then if we just monitor the program, you'll see that there, the runtime frames, the frames for the open MP runtime system are intermixed with the user code. And so the idea was if we can just define as part of the OpenMP standard um, a, a tooling interface, and then we could appropriately address these things. So we started this process, oh, maybe in 2012 or so, um, defining this uh, OpenMP tools API. And so what it was supposed to do was to add to, to specify that the runtime system had to respond to uh, certain uh, query operations, and it also had to maintain certain information inside it and provide uh, certain callbacks. And that if this was part of the OpenMP standard, then a group such as mine could just build a tool on top of the OpenMP tools interface, and then you could use it with the GNU OpenMP compiler, with Clang, with IBM XL compilers, and it would all look great. You would have this high level global view of what the, uh, the application looks like. So, um, so the design objectives for this tools interface was to enable tools to measure and attribute costs to the application source and the runtime system. So let me just do a quick, uh, well, actually I'll, I'll, I'll demo this with, uh, with the HPCG application that, uh, we uh, included in the example codes. So I'll get to that in a few minutes. So currently, um, HPC Toolkit has support for the OMPT interface based on OpenMP5. And there's, uh, there's prototype implementations of this in, in LLVM. And so actually my group has a, a copy of this. Um, we have in, in our HPC Toolkit project, we have a, a a fork of LLVM, and we have the latest uh, implementation of the tools interface. So we have the tools interface support for both CPUs and for GPUs. So this is something that we are currently working to upstream back into LLVM, and then also working with AMD to add to their runtime for their um, AOMP compiler that they're planning to deliver for Frontier. So IBM has um, support, IBM's lightweight OpenMP runtime has support for OpenMP5. When we ran some things on Summit, um, there were some indications that the support was there, but it didn't seem to be used by the tool. And so I'm a bit puzzled. I noticed also that the runtimes that were on Summit were not the same um, runtimes that I was exchanging with IBM. We uh, worked closely with Alexander Eichenberger and he sent us copies of their runtime and, and it said LOMP, lightweight OMP. And what's on Summit is something called XL SOMP. And so I'm not sure what to make of it. All I can say is that for the examples that we ran on Summit, we didn't see the OpenMP tools interface being used there uh, or being provided by the, uh, by the application, uh, sorry, by the runtime system. So I must say that we didn't look at this very carefully because we were trying to get a, a set of examples working on CPUs, on GPUs, and on uh, two different processors. So um, we didn't do any investigation. So it, it may be there and it may work. And if someone's interested, we can take a look today. So um, in the examples that, that we have on, on Cori, we actually built a, a copy of the LLVM OpenMP runtime that we had, had developed. And so we had made some changes to this as, as recent as two weeks ago. And um, 
And so the with the OpenMP runtime, you, what you might see is in general, when you're running uh, multi-threaded programs, you might see that there's um, program root and thread root appears in your profiles. And so program root, think of as, as the main program. And then if it spawns worker threads, those end up being listed under thread root. Using the OMPT interface, it takes all of the time under here. And if it, if it can figure out where it came from with the parallel regions, then it integrates it into program root. And you see this global view that has the kind of full call paths that you would expect. Whereas um, if they're in thread root, then they're going to look like the ones that I showed you a minute ago, where they're these program fragments that were being launched by the runtime. So without the OMPT interface, you'll see a lot of this. And with the OMPT interface, almost all the time will be under program root. And so it's a little bit easier to analyze in that case. Yeah. Um, I had yes. a quick question. Uh, does this fix the problem where I was bringing up the other day where if you're at different levels in the code, like the OpenMP will be right because of this? Yes. Remember we are looking at the levels? Yeah, so this this yes. fixes that. So let me, let me pull up and, and show you an example here. Um, I think the example would, would help. Windows are appearing on the other screen. Okay. okay. Demos. Let's see here. Okay, so here's here's a version of this. Code Lulesh is a Livermore, um, a Livermore code um, that that does. Uh, it's a, a proxy app for their ultra uh, proxy app Ultrashot code, and so here you can see that um, uh, it says 1.4 percent under program root and 98.6 percent under thread root. So this was run on a machine we have that has two Broadwell processors, so it ends up with. 72 hardware threads. So what we have is this is like one thread's worth of data and this is 71 threads worth of data. And so if I look under thread root, what I see is the following. And this was built with uh, Raja templates. And so the Raja templates, well, there's a template um, for, for all. And, and so what we see at the top is it just brings us into the, the template library and you see that there's a for all and it's evaluating a loop body. Okay, that's not helpful. Well, if we go look inside that and we see, you know, well, there's a loop and then we look inside that and then we uh, see that there's a call to something and then the thing that it called, now this is a piece that was torn out of, out of their code as a Lambda function, okay? And so this is, this is what it looks like when you have Raja templates, um, and we don't have the OMP tools interface, and you see that uh, that it's all visible in this context: launch worker, launch thread, invoke task, invoke microtask. I don't think that that's helpful at all. Um, and then in the the program route, where the main program is executing stuff, then you see that there are call paths here, and then there's pieces of the runtime where we enter the runtime to implement this for all, and then it uh, ended up going through a couple of frames in the OpenMP runtime system before we came out in this outline function that's implementing the, the for all loop. But at least here we get to see where it was invoked from. So if we look, look back, uh, let's see where I'm gonna find this. Several levels up the template uh, hierarchy. Here we go. Right. So this is this is showing us like we invoke this Raja for all, and then all the the rest of the stuff in here is like details of the Raja template library, and then the runtime library, and then this is what we're actually executing, and the lambda function gets executed at the bottom. So this is this is a sort of a global view, but you you still get to see you still see the OpenMP runtime. The real problem here is that. Almost all of the performance is presented in this confusing way 
where I have to go look under each of these outline functions and find out what was actually called. So this is calc hourglass force for elements. What about this? And this is calc monotonic T region for elements. Okay. I would argue no one wants to analyze a program this way. So to address this problem, we, we built the OMPT interface. So now I'll show you the same program where we collected the data with the OMPT interface. Okay, so now it says 47% of the time is in program root, 54% of the time is in idle, where like the OpenMP, um, OpenMP is just idle. And then under thread root, there's like 0.1% that, that we couldn't figure out where it went. Like we were, we took some, we took a sample and we were in the middle of, of uh, sort of setting this thing up and couldn't like, couldn't relate it to any open MP, anything. It like, it wasn't idle waiting for work. It, it, it was, uh, it was getting to the point where we go idle waiting for work. And so this is only 0.1% of the, the execution time. And so that's, not a big deal. The real nice thing is that now with the OMP tools interface, you get this intuitive view that shows you sort of a full call path that contains loops and inline functions. And we see like calc hourglass control for elements, uh, let's see, force for elements. Now we go into some Raja templates and then we come back out in the code at the bottom. And so you get to see, you get to see all of your program execution time attributed at the bottom of, of call chains that are meaningful to you as an application developer. And so right. that, yeah. I was gonna say, and also you get in the, in the depth view, everybody's at the same depth. That's exactly right. So it exactly addresses the, the question that you were concerned about where this calc hourglass force for elements was going to be either at a depth here in the master thread and in the worker thread, it was going to be underneath something like you know, launch worker, launch thread, launch, right? You know, maybe three levels deep where it said invoke microtask. Yep. Okay. So, um, so this, if you have this integrated high level view, then this makes it much easier to do scaling experiments where you say, okay, um, the, the performance data is roughly in a tree. And what I want to do is say, I want to run it on say, 10 threads, 20 threads, 30 threads, and I can compare and difference them. And I'll talk about that with the differential analysis in just a minute. Is there a way to figure out why 54% of the time the threads are idle? That would seem to be what you'd want to work on. Okay, so green is idle. Um, so the, the answer is we have a technique for that. And it was implemented previously in our tool using a feature that the OpenMP Standards Committee took out of the runtime um, interface when I missed a committee meeting. People said, oh, this is useless. And uh, they were wrong. So we're working on re-implementing it. So, so here's the, the, the thing, Steve. Like when, when you're in a thread and it's idle, what you want to know is like, just to know that the thread is sitting there waiting for work, that tells you nothing. What you really want to know is what else is going on? And you know, what else can I, so if, if there's serial code somewhere while I'm sitting working or while I'm sitting waiting, then I would like to blame the serial code for my idleness saying that's not shedding enough parallelism. So um, in, a, in a previous implementation of, uh, of HPC toolkit on top of LLVM OpenMP, we had support for this blame shifting. And now we have it in a branch, but as I mentioned, we just reassembled the OpenMP runtime about two weeks ago. And so we haven't yet fully integrated um, our, our support for this blame shifting idea. So um, I think I can show you an example of that. Let me see. So in this, John, do we even know what the master thread is? Who, who's the master thread? Because it looks like just everybody's doing random work and waiting randomly. Well, 
let's see, the, the master thread is, is going to be thread zero. So you can see that there's a, a little different stuff that's, that's happening on, on thread zero. Okay, I see. so while, while this is happening, um, at least thread one is idle. And we can look and see that, yeah, things are sort of basically idle for this period of time. Um, so I think I have a, a well, I, I know I have an example and it's just mixed in my terabyte um, to, to show you an example of uh, the AMG code. So this morning I was running some examples on the, the cluster does anybody have an example of the AMG 2013? Did they run that on on the uh, compute nodes on core, on KNL? Okay. Um, maybe one of my group could run one of those. If someone could run um, an AMG 2013 example and get a database. I have a, a HPCG example, but uh, uh, AMG... you have one? Um, how do I get it to you? It's the uh, CPU. Uh, well, John, um, I have some AMG 2006 that I've run be... and demoed on Theta. Do you want me to try to tar copy a, a database for you or? Um, actually, if you just open a viewer on it. I can give you the file, uh, the directory, right? I need to tar it and give, give it to you. Okay. And how are you going to give it to me? Uh, on Corey, I just sent a, was a command called give. And okay. what is your uh, username? John MC. John MC. Okay. Let me do that. G. Oh, I think I have one here. I see I, I did a run this morning, but I hadn't gotten to the analyze stage because it got caught in a queue. Uh, uh, okay, I think I'm gonna have one in yeah. a second. Okay. Hopefully this this run worked because I haven't looked at this data yet. Let's see. Okay, so here is a case where where in this initial region in the code. We have a main thread that's active, and then these threads are are idle. I mentioned that we're still working on this OpenMP runtime. It says that they're in a barrier. Well, when you're in a barrier, you're idle. So it's sort of this is sort of a technical issue where what we're reporting is kind of too close of of uh, of uh, an approximation of of what's in the the state. Um, so what, what happens actually when threads go idle, they sit, well, when, when a thread is active in a parallel region, it gets launched. And then at the end of the parallel region, it enters a barrier. And then it never leaves that barrier until it begins new parallel work. So you can think of the way that it goes idle is it enters a barrier at the end of a parallel region and then the region gets torn apart. And then at the moment we're representing that by just saying that it's barrier instead of saying that it's, that it's idle. But here's the, here's the thing. So if you look at the traces, what you can see is, Mark, actually, if you do have the blame shifting data for the other, uh, AMG example, that would be great. Well, John, I just gave you my uh, data. Okay, but uh, that, doesn't have, that doesn't have the blame shifting thing. Right, in right, it I that, don't, of course. 
Okay. Uh, it, it, so, it, it may take a few minutes. I, I think you should continue on. Yeah, I'll, I have to, I, I have to I'll, go I'll, finish I'll, it I'll, off with data. Okay. So, um, so what, what we can see is in over in like this region of the program, there's like a main thread that's, that's working and then all of these other threads are idle. And what we would like to do is to be able to blame the idleness on whatever the master thread is doing. And so if there were say three threads working and five threads idle, then we would split up the blame and attribute that to whoever was actually working to say, whatever you're doing, you're not shedding enough parallelism. So if you look at it in this view, then all of the, the things that show up in barrier just mean that it's, it's not doing anything useful. So let me just go into the procedure color map and just say, if, if in fact we're in a barrier, then I'll just make that red. Okay, now the execution looks sort of a lot less efficient and pleasing. In fact, if we go and we look in, um, we look in detail at what's going on, the, the application has two phases. Well, it's a benchmark. So there's a, there's a setup phase and there's a, a solve phase. I think I'm zoomed in a little too far. There we go. Okay, so um, what what we can see here is that there's a, a set of threads in a process. And so you notice that on the left-hand side, there's these color bands. And so the leftmost color band says everybody in the same process, and then it alternates between two colors for individual threads. And so everybody that belongs to the same process is shown with say this um, light blue and then the the darker color means that these threads are another process. So what we can see is that if we look at the threads in a process, we see that for the solver, in fact, there's a load imbalance. There's like four threads that are working and then there's four threads that are sort of underused. Um, so, and, and that pattern sort of continues. And the reason for, for this in, in this particular application is that they're, they're doing multi-grid and they were dividing up the work among the threads. And so the application decided uh, which thread was gonna do which part of the grid. And so if uh, the application has K threads, then it cut it up into K pieces and it turned out that those K pieces were imbalanced. And that shows up in rank after rank, um, iteration after iteration of the solver that, that there's imbalance and the higher number of threads have too little work. So one of my students took a look at this uh, a number of years ago and found out that that you could improve the load imbalance by just telling the uh, application, well, you know, you were going to, there's K threads. So rather than cutting it up for K threads, why don't you cut it up for five K threads? And then instead of using static scheduling, why don't we use dynamic scheduling instead? So you would get a chunk of iteration, you would get a chunk of work. And then when you run out, you go back for more. And it turns out that that was successful in dealing with this, uh, this pervasive load imbalance. So um, at, the, at the high level, this open MP view, this, the open MP view, instead of just telling us that we're in like launch worker, launch thread, it's giving us application context in all cases. Now in the cases where it says OMP barrier, it should probably just say idle in, in here rather than barrier, but that's sort of a, a, a NIF in, in a work in progress. Okay. So uh, I have a question. Yeah. Does that approach result in better balance between the threads, but worse cash performance? Um, we would have to use perf events to see whether it hurts the cash performance. My, my recollection, this is a number of years back, but I think that uh, it actually improved the overall performance. And so if it improves the overall performance, then 
um, you know, that, then that would be would mean that there's a good trade off between cash misses versus load balance. Yeah, that's what yeah. I that's what I right. thought you were trying to say. I just wanted to know if, you know, it's clear the overall time is is reduced because the load imbalance is better, but the right. performance of each thread might be a little bit worse than the ones that were running before. That's all I'm asking. And That's, I think, yes, and, and, I, and, I, and I think you're probably right. And, and so then one would need to look at that with, um, with perf events if you wanted to get to the, the bottom of that. Okay, let me switch back. Uh, so to, John, if you still want yeah. my old uh, 2006 databases, I copied a tar file to Corey for you. Okay. And I, I don't, that on? So in my home directory, you'll find two tar files, um, uh, db-amg something or other. Are you MW Crentel on this machine? No, I'm, I'm Crentel on Corey. What machine are you on? You're on Corey? Corey. So you'll find, yeah, those two. Probably the one that says DB AMG OMPT is probably makes sense. I haven't opened, these are old. I haven't opened them in several years, but these were things that I used as demos at Argon. Yeah, I can't read them. Okay, we'll come back to that. Make can't it, read. Oh, fuck. Uh, hold on one second. <laughs> All right. So um, I, I mentioned here, okay, so the idle time is reported as barrier. Um, and then I, I looked at, at using this on Summit, uh, the, the, the new version of the LLVM OpenMP runtime that we had built. And um, we were not able to because the IBM and the PGI compilers um, uh, wire, the, the wire library paths into their binaries. John, I have a question. Yes. The question you were talking about uh, going from static that static scheduling was better than dynamic scheduling and yet you can and you continue to use threads and uh, you got better performance and the threads weren't idle as before. My question is the following. Did you also investigate, huh? So, so my comment there was- I haven't, I haven't asked the question yet. The question is, did you- did you think of using doing things sequentially within the process and or did you think of using some other threads doing things sequentially within those other threads as opposed to just using threads within the process of the first of the calling thread? Well, um, so what I would say is that we didn't look too hard at trying to optimize this. I mean, uh, the, the focus of my group's work is mostly on building the tools. And so anytime we optimize a program, um, it, there, there's usually there, there's a, a reason for it. Either we're looking for uh, an example for a paper where we exploit an insight or we're working with an application team that actually cares about what the performance was. And so for the AMG benchmark, nobody really cared enough for us to actually go back and do that. So we okay. didn't invest. Okay. okay, thank you. All right. Um, I have some bizarre blue line in my display here, and I'm hoping that I don't know what that's from. Well, anyway, I fixed the permissions on the files, but you should, you probably just want to go on. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that later if someone wants to follow up on OMPT. Um, I don't know why I have. Hey John, if you go into annotate and then you have to hit clear, clear my drawings, that, that'll usually get rid of it. Uh, let's see. It's yeah. on the PDF, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not on the PDF. It's not on the PDF. It's not, it's on your oh, no, actually, actually it, it is it is some sort of annotations that are happening right now. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a zoom annotation. Zoom. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't mean to turn that on. I must have just clicked on it somehow. Okay, clear, clear all drawings. There we go. Thank there you. it is. Thank you. <laughs> I'm still in drawing mode. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just going to be careful, I guess. 
All yeah, right. If you close That's the good. annotations, then you'll get out of drawing mode. All right. Let's let's see that. All right. Um, I don't want to spend too much time in this because I'd rather spend time working with people um, on uh, on at their applications. So let me just uh, let me just go through. So I wanted to mention differential performance analysis because this is something that's useful for both um, CPU and GPU codes. So you know the problem is well when you're scaling to a large number of of threads or GPUs and you notice that your efficiency is dropping off, then your question is what's causing that? And so the the goal is to have some sort of automatic scalability analysis that will pinpoint the bottlenecks and guide you to the problem and quantify the magnitude of each problem. And then ideally you'd like it to diagnose what's wrong. Well, I think we have a solution for the first three, but then diagnosing exactly what's wrong is really kind of complicated. It depends upon a lot of things in your code. We can tell you the problem is here and we can tell you how much it costs, but the, the ultimate diagnosis is really left to you. And so you'll see with an example what this what this really looks like. So for parallel applications, often there's like lots of layers of libraries and the performance is context dependent. So for instance, in like some sort of climate code where you might be having land, sea ice, ocean, and atmosphere simulations. And uh, you, if you found that your program spent time in MPI weight, um, you would need to know the call stack to find out that there's a problem with the atmosphere or a problem with the ocean. So we wanna have call stack profiling. If you were just told that you spend time in MPI weight, that doesn't help you when you have such a complicated application. So for us, what we wanna be able to do is understand these bottlenecks no matter what they are, whether they're computation or data movement or synchronization, we don't know. And the constraints we have are that we have to have a low uh, data volume we can't be recording everything that the application does because otherwise we, we perturb your execution too much. And so we perturb the execution too much, we're changing the behavior and also it's gonna make it so that it's not useful in large scale runs. So the, <clears throat> the thing is that you have um, expectations for what your code is going to do. So maybe you're, you're trying to do strong scaling. And so if I double the number of processors, then I expect linear speed up. Or maybe you're doing weak scaling where when you double the number of processors, you also double the problem size so that the, uh, the amount of work that's being done by each processor, it should be constant, okay? So the thing is, if you have these expectations, then you can put these expectations to work. You can measure your performance under different conditions with either different levels of parallelism or different inputs or both. And then you express your expectations as an equation and then compute the deviation of from expectations for each calling context, and then correlate this with the source code and explore the annotated um, calling context tree. So let me give you an example here. So if, um, if we're running some, um, so, so let's say that, that, that first we're, we're running the application and we're running it on say uh, 256 cores. And we find out that we spend 400K units of time in some solve. And then when we scale that out to 8K cores, we're doing strong scaling. And under strong scaling, then um, we would expect that the amount of the total amount of time that we spent in the solver across all of the, the ranks is, uh, is the same. And if we spend more time, then that's wasted effort. Okay, because a strong scaling problem, essentially the cost and their distribution should be exactly the same, no matter which, um, which number of processors you ran it on. So if I ran it on, if I ran it on uh, 10 processors and then I ran it on 20 processors, I would expect that it would run in half the time, but it would still spend equal amounts of time in the solver across the, the two executions. So what we can do is we can take this insight that, um, we spent different amounts of time in here. And then we can, we can take the, the, the distribution of the costs for the large scale execution and subtract off the distribution of the costs in the, in the smaller scale execution and then compute the differences. And so this difference here is wasted effort. And if we, if we take this and we divide it by the total 
amount of time that was spent in the whole run, then it becomes a fraction of wasted effort. And from the fraction of wasted effort, that's the same thing as the as scalability loss. So I'll, I'll show you an example here. So. Close this one. All right, so this is this uh, flash code from the University of Chicago. We ran it on 256 cores and we ran it on um, 8K cores. And so in the user interface, I can just, you know, explore and find out where the application spent its time. But, you know, and, and I can do that like focused on where I spent my time with 256 threads or with or with 256 cores or with 8k cores. Now this is a weak scaling experiment and what I have here is data from one rank and under weak scaling you expect that the execution time is going to be is going to be the same. okay Now the fact that that this 5 times 10 to the 8 differs from 6.71 times 10 to the 8 that is scaling loss okay If under weak scaling, if I double the problem size and double the number of processors, then I expect the times to be the same. So now I'll just apply this idea that I was just showing you on, on the slide where I'm going, to take, I'm going to take the inclusive time on 8K cores and I'm going to difference, I'm gonna subtract the inclusive time on 256 cores. And so that's computing wasted effort. And then I'll divide it by the total time on 8K cores. So there's a difference here where you say pointwise or aggregate. The pointwise means like at every point in the calling context tree, the aggregate means like the cost at the root, the, the total cost. So I'll divide it by the, the aggregate cost on 8K cores. So that's my fraction of wasted effort. And then I can multiply that by 100 and get percent wasted effort. And percent wasted effort is same as, um, as scalability loss. And I'm gonna write this as a, as a, it's an inclusive metric and I'm gonna write it as a percent. And so I'm just going to display this as a percent. Okay, so that tells me that I have a scaling loss of, of 25%. And I can see that there's 14% is in 14% of the scaling losses in the evolve phase and 14% I'm sorry 10% is in the init phase. So I'll just I'll I'm going to pick the init phase first cuz I know something. So I say show me where the scaling loss is and it takes me down here um, deep into the computation and if I look around a little bit I notice it says that there's a loop over all processors. Now the line that actually came up is a couple of lines below this. And the reason is that the attribution of, of loops, what we do is we say that the loop exists at the line where the first machine instruction came from. And so this was the first machine instruction that appeared in the loop. And so that's why we ended up with this, this mapping. But, so, but very nearby, we see a loop over all processors. Well, if we have, 256 cores versus 8K cores, we're gonna go through this loop a lot more times with 8K cores, okay? So that's a reason for the scaling loss, but what's really going on? Well, what's really going on is if you look at this, this is um, AMR refine, derefine, AMR Morton process, find surrounding blocks. So what happens is they're doing block structured AMR. And so after, after some number of refinements in the block structured AMR, you have a data block and you wanna know what are my neighboring data blocks? And because these were distributed with space filling curves in Morton order, um, the data blocks are scattered all over the processors in the system. And so the way that they find the blocks that are neighboring is they say, so here's the blocks that I have and let me take that information and I'll send it to my right neighbor. And then we'll, we'll circle that, and my right neighbor is going to do the same thing. Everybody's going to do the same thing. So everybody's circulating the information about what they have around the ring. And so basically, it's like an all to all communication where everybody's telling everybody else, here's what I've got. And then you select out and say, oh, 
this is this is who's got my neighboring block, and so that's who I have to communicate with. And so we end up um, spending all this time on on calls to send, receive, replace as uh, as this data is cycling around the ring, and the ring is proportional to the number of processors. That's how many times we have to cycle things around the ring. Okay, so high level point. Using this technique with with just a with an equation in a spreadsheet and then say, show me the call path, um, I came down upon this bottleneck. Now, if you see what's going on here, I just explained it to you. You can understand why we can't tell you exactly what it is and exactly how to fix it. Okay. This is something that requires some deep application knowledge about what's going on in order to address the scaling loss. So we, we talked to uh, Anshu Dube, who was, um, who was one of the, the leads of, on the flash code. And the first thing which he said is, that's not my code. You know, the thing that has the scaling loss, that's not my code. We just, you know, we got this library from NASA called Paramesh and like, that's what Paramesh does. Um, so what, um, what, what she did do though, is she looked at, well, do we really actually have to ask everybody, you know, what they have? And what they found is that through properties of the space filling curve, there's only a few neighbors who actually might have uh, neighbors in the space filling curve who would possibly have the blocks that surround me. And so by then looking, by communicating only with that fixed number of neighbors, then they could avoid this all to all communication, which in this case was circling, cycling things around the ring. And then they could turn that into um, a much more, uh, more scalable behavior. So this is, this is not good for just um, one thing. So I, I mentioned like we found this one bottleneck. So if we go back up to back up to the top in the init phase, we see that most of it was in the init domain where I was looking. So there's also some in grid init. And let's go look and see where that comes up. Well, so here's a call to MPI barrier. And then we see something that says, Endo I proc equals. Oh, that seems suspicious. It seems just like the same sort of thing before. Well, if we look a little closer, there's a whole bunch of reads. And then there's a loop that says iterate over all the processors. If it's my turn, open the input file. Well, I'm going to bet that at some point they ran this thing on 20,000 cores and everybody opened the input file and they crashed the file system. And so somebody said, well, why don't we just take turns and I'll just put this little uh, conditional in here and we'll all open it one at a time and then we won't crash. And then I'll just get on with my work. And, but you know, they left behind a little scaling bottleneck and it's only a little thing. It's like 1.97% for this run, but we can find it. Okay, so that was in the initialization phase. So then we look at the evolve phase where the scaling loss is, is also high. And then um, this, I, I press the flame button and it, it drops down in the, in the call stack until the cost shatters some. So I'll just pick the first thing, which is the, the highest uh, sorted cost inside the scope where, um, where my scaling loss is largest. And then if I look, I find that, oh, actually we're back in the same um, loop overall processors in fine surrounding blocks. So in the initialization phase, they're doing some of this refinement, de-refinement and, and uh, finding surrounding blocks. And that happens in the evolve phase too. So basically we have, you know, a couple of bottlenecks here account for a significant fraction of the scaling loss. And despite the fact that this is a hundred thousand lines of Fortran, it didn't take too much to find them by just uh, writing this equation and then clicking around. Any questions about this? Did they solve the read problem? I think I have a solution. They can broadcast, right? Exactly. <laughs> Master. Yes. Cap zero well, reads. Everyone else re receives the broadcast. That's, that, that's right. I mean, so what, what you have to look at this was like, you know, this is a lazy Thursday where someone said, hey, I crashed the file system. Let me fix that in like two lines of code. And, and they did. And then they never looked back, right? But they left it. Okay. So this, um, this scaling loss, so, so this worked well because everything is in a tree because like everything is rooted at flash and I can go find where the losses are in the tree. If I have, if I'm not using the OMPT interface and I have things broken up into master and thread root, 
then this, the top-down analysis doesn't work well on a tree, but I'm uh, sorry, on a forest. But if you do the analysis bottom up, then you can, you can actually get uh, some of the same benefits. So if uh, instead of inclusive scaling loss, I computed exclusive scaling loss. So my colleague, uh, Zhao Zhu Meng, who is, is here, did this for a code um, pick on GPU, which he was running on, um, on a collection of AMD GPUs. And he was looking at scaling over one GPU versus scaling over 16 GPUs. And so then you can compute sort of a, a scaling metric just the same way that I did, except that rather than computing inclusive scaling loss, you can compute exclusive scaling loss. And then you look at it in the bottom up view and, show, and say, show me where the exclusive scaling losses are the largest and then show me how I got there. And then even if you got there by different call paths because of those master worker threads, you'll be able to find the places where the loss is big. So, um, so this technique applies for not only CPU code, you can use this differential analysis technique on, on GPU codes as well. All right. Um, last thing, uh, kernel sample. So um, when you use sampling in the Linux perf event subsystem, you can sample not only activity in the user space, you can also sample kernel space activity. So when a thread is frozen in, uh, when a thread is active in the kernel, the user level calling context is frozen. And so what we do is we attribute kernel activity to the point where we enter the kernel from the user level calling context. And so let me just show you a, a live demo of this. So um, I don't think that Corey is configured to be able to, to do this, but um, let me show you this quick uh, example. Um, So this is also included in the tutorial examples. I apologize that it was uh, broken previously, but um, I didn't focus on it because our focus was on GPUs um, for this tutorial. So here, this is a very simple program. So it uh, main as a loop and it calls do work. And do work calls malloc and allocates a large temporary and then hops through the temporary um, 4096 words at a time and then assigns the number 10. Okay. And so if I monitor this with real time and find out where does it spend its time, it spends 99.3% of its time on this line where it's assigning the number 10. Anybody have any idea why we're spending our time there? Are we computing? Cash? Hmm? For memory. Cash? The page faults. Yes. So Rishi understands. So so the view here, I just measured the I just measured real time. Okay. And it says I'm spending my time in this loop. Now, so suppose you were writing some um, some complex solver and you found that you spent your time inside your solver loop, you'd be pretty happy. But maybe you're uh, maybe you're a little bit deluded about what's going on. Um, so now I'm going to measure with perf events, and and so I'm measuring. Eight, I'm saying HPC run dash e cycles, and so an important part is that um, this particular machine. I'm doing this on a machine at Rice. This machine is configured so that perf events is allowed to take kernel samples. And now what we find is if we, if we look at where we spent our time, we can see that, so where do we spend our, our, our cycles? And we see that on line 11 and line 12, line 12 we have 
page faults, page fault handler, um, mapping pages, clearing pages. Okay. And so really what you're spending your time doing is not this. You're spending all of your time clearing pages in the operating system. 90% of the time you're clearing pages in the operating system. Okay. Is that a security thing? Because there's no, I mean, malloc doesn't require clear pages. Well, um, if so, the thing is that this was a large allocation. Okay, so n is large, and so when it was malloc and then freed, malloc returned the pages to the operating system, and then when you when you go around the loop again and you malloc them again, then it gives you pages back, but the pages it gets back from the operating system, it clears them for security before giving you the pages. Yeah, okay, that's what I was asking. So it's because of the security, of the, uh, not because of, because Malik has no, has no, um, uh, has no behavior if you just, you know, say I want, I want some pages, they're just random data. They could be random data. That's right. It, it, that's it right. Totally yeah, so it totally depends on where the page was before. If it's right. a page from the same process, then your argument is correct. Mm -hmm. If a page came from a, of a different process, then it, it has to do it for security. Mm -hmm. So I think, though, that it doesn't, when you release pages, I don't think the operating system keeps track of there's a page on the free list and who had it last. It just says there's a page on the free list. So it, it, just, it, 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 it will keep track of who had it last. Okay. Yeah, and also it, malloc will have its own free heap, and only if you uh, you know got rid of a big m mapped page does the kernel even know about it. Yes, agreed. So anyway, so so what this shows is um, this shows all, all of the page faults, and that we're actually spending our time down inside the kernel. So then um, there's a another example here. If I say make uh, run uh, dash pf, so this is actually going to monitor cycles and it's going to monitor um, page faults. And so then we can see with, uh, with perf events that in fact, that in fact, the reason for this is that we've got all of these page faults that are occurring, okay? And then the page fault handler is getting us pages and clearing them, okay? All right, so what are you to do as an application developer? This is all nice to know. Well, actually, it's sort of terrifying to know. John, but, one uh, quick question. Yes. At the level of program root, there was a partial call path, uh, some thing. What, what is the partial? Oh, in the previous, at least in uh, yeah, these, yeah. there was, what, what is that? Could you explain a bit? So what, what that means is we tried to unwind the call stack and we never made it all the way back to the root, all, all the way back to main. So we're working our way up the call stack and then for some reason we couldn't get out to the caller frame. Why can that happen? Well, what we found is that sometimes the compiler generates bad um, dwarf information, which tells us how to unwind the call stack. So mm -hmm. we try to use the information that the compiler provides. If the compiler provides us with junk, then Sometimes we can't unwind with it. The other mm -hmm. thing that we do is we actually do on the fly binary analysis to try and figure out how to unwind. And so that's something that we do on both the power architecture and on the x86 architecture. And so if there's no information from the compiler, then we'll try our own uh, analysis. It works mm -hmm. a lot of the time, but sometimes we just can't figure out what's going on. And so that's another case where we might be in a frame and not be able to get to the caller. Okay. okay, understood. And so you, also when you run a program, sometimes you might see program root, sometimes you might see partial call pass, and then other times you might see some you know, strange routines. Those should all be listed under partial call pass. Consider that a bug in HPC toolkit, anything that shows up here that's not like program root or thread root or partial call pass or OMP idle. If you just see names of random functions, it's a sign that our unwinder is having trouble and it couldn't even figure out how to put them under partial call paths. It, it seemed like the unwinds were okay for some reason. And like it was it was a bad unwind and we didn't recognize it. Okay. okay. All right. So now let me show you. Do work called multiple times in that example? 
it, it was there, there there was a loop um so could could the programmer have done the malloc outside of do work and passed pointers to the memory pointer to the memory would that solve the problem that would solve the problem i'm going to show you another solution yeah i, I think the better idea is to use huge pages or use calic So this make fast example, um, we still see the, the cost of, of uh, down in, on this loop. But if we actually look at the, at, at the cost here, um, what, what, what we'll see is that this cost is 1.5 times 10 to the ninth. If I bring up the other example, Choosers. Let's see. Uh, it is slow. So this is, in fact, exactly the same code. And so we find in the slow cases, it's 2.59 times 10 to the 10th. And here it's 1.5 1, 1 times 10 to the to the ninth, okay? So it's significantly faster over here than over here. And the only thing that I did is I linked this with TC malloc. So TC malloc does not turn pages back over to the operating system. It hangs onto them inside your address space. So even after they're freed, when we go back to reallocate them, it's just taking pages that are already allocated in the address space. And so it doesn't have to spend all of that time clearing the pages. And so the point is that some allocators, so I don't know whether by default, they've been doing some work on malloc and they've been doing some work on making malloc thread conscious. Um, but here we can see that there's definitely a difference between using malloc and here I'm calling malloc, except that I'm linked against the TC malloc library. So I'm using exactly the same user code. It just runs a lot faster because I'm using a better allocator or an allocator that doesn't turn pages back over to the operating system. So John, so, I just want to say, yeah. I often use Calic because in Linux, at least it uses copy on write pages and, and it only touches the pages that I touch. Um, I find mm -hmm. that works a lot better in many cases too. That's a, that's a good suggestion. And so the, the only thing that I was really trying to convey with this example is that there are there can be hidden costs here that that you know nothing about if you're only monitoring things and you're not seeing what's going on in the kernel okay and so if you're just using cpu time or you're using real time you're only getting part of the picture even if you're using cycles um we're not monitoring inside the kernel unless we can actually show you call paths i think one could one could argue that maybe we should change the way that we do that so that even if we can't get kernel call paths, we should just show you that there's a giant pile of samples down here that um, come from calls into Linux, even if we can't tell what they are. So the the way the Cori is configured, and I, I checked on Summit, and I think that the configuration is similar. similar. There's something called proc k all sins that says, what's the addresses of the, the routines in the kernel? And on Cori, they're all listed as zero. And so what that means is if we collected any, any sampling data and we got program counter locations out of the kernel using perf, we can't interpret them. And so in, the, in that case, we're just throwing them away and saying, well, there's not much point. One could argue that maybe we should tell you that there's a lot of time in the kernel, just we don't know what it is. That would probably be better. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about kernel sampling. So it's it's useful because on on well configured systems, you can get a lot of insight and figure out that actually the problem isn't with your application or the, the problem isn't what you think it is. So there was a code called this uh, Lulesh code from Livermore that I showed you earlier. There was a version that they an early version that they developed. And 
So what what it would do is it would go down on, inside the call chain and then it would allocate a work array and then do something with it and then free the work array. And the problem that code had was exactly the same problem that I just illustrated here. In fact, we developed this capability after spending a lot of time trying to figure out what was going on because with Lulesh, it was just pointing into the work loops and saying you're spending time here. And so that looked that looked good until you started looking at how many cycles I spent there and how many instructions I executed. You realized that actually the number of instructions I execute is pretty slow, is pretty low. And so it was spending a fair amount of time um, clearing pages. All right. Um, and I guess maybe there was one more thing I wanted to mention. Um, so something that we do in our user interface is something that we call context recycling. So on some codes may create a large number of very short live threads. So we're working with this code called DCA++ um, at uh, Oak Ridge. And so they were running uh, 160 MPI ranks and that uh, over a relatively brief execution, it generated 1.2 million thread profiles and traces. And so what we found was that the, the trace looked like little snippets all along the main diagonal, like basically something would be born, it would do a little something and then it would die. And so the whole trace looked like just a little snippet around the main diagonal. And so this is a, a synthetic code that we wrote just to sort of illustrate the problem a little better where you create a bunch of threads and then the threads die and then you go and create another bunch of threads. And so you get another trace line for each of the new threads and then they die and then you get another trace line. And we decided that having this sort of, you know, the traces along the main diagonal and just maybe having, you know, a million of a million trace lines was just not very effective. So what we did was when a thread completes, um, when a thread runs for a while and then, and then completes and finishes, then we, we can reallocate that trace line so that if another thread is born and the intervals are non-overlapping, then we pack them in. So what's shown at the bottom here is the packed in version of what's shown on the top. And so um, what we're, the, the white between them indicates that there's like no thread active for that period of time. And so the thread activity is punctuated by inactivity. And what that means is that a thread was born, it died, and then some other thread sort of took its place on the trace line. So just to show you that this can be, you know, relatively useful, this, this showed the DCA plus um, where it has 10 ranks and then where 12 threads um, each executing with the context recycling, instead of having a million trace lines, we end up with just a modest number where because there were so many things where they were using say standard async to launch something on a GPU. And so the standard async would create a thread and then the thread would die as soon as the computation was finished. And we just packed them in. So it's something that is useful to know that we're doing this because otherwise you might be confused. Now for GPU streams, I don't think that we're packing multiple GPU streams into the same streamline. I think we keep our GPU streams separate. We haven't found many applications that create and destroy streams repeatedly, although I'm sure that someone's got the exception that we, uh, we need to pay attention to. All right, so John, that's, that's about all. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Just to understand the previous, uh, previous slide, uh, can you go back? Please. Yeah. So in the top, it's uh, so the y uh, x axis is still timeline and y axis. Those are five ranks or not? I mean, um, uh, sorry. Well, yeah. So like, like think of think of the y axis as being threads here. Okay. So what happens is, uh, so here's maybe fifty threads are are mm -hmm. born and then they die, and then another fifty are born and then they die, and then another fifty are born and then they die. And, and each of them are on, each of these groups are on separate trace lines. But for, for the, the first thread of this group, why leave the display empty for the whole rest? If there's another thread that was born at some later time, why can't we just take the trace line for say the first thread in the second group and, mm -hmm. put it in, and put it up here? And so that's what we've shown here. And then that's what yields this 
view for DCA++, where all the blank spaces in here mean that the CPU thread was idle. And, and so it's showing when you were active, what you were doing. And if you zoom in, you can see that there's actually, you know, idle time between them. And, okay. but I argue that this is a lot better than having a million trace lines. Okay, so in the previous slide, uh, still in the second uh, second uh, trace, those y axis still represent those are fifty vertical lines, right? In total, is that correct? Uh, I have to zoom in and see uh, what what it is. Mean, it's, it's it's actually one hundred and seventy six. But okay. so if those here, are only here, fifty so, tracks. So, so are... here, okay. So so here it says I, I said fifty. I was just making that up. So here it says that. Um, you probably can't see as I'm zooming this. So yeah. here it says zero to 880. And then on the bottom, it says zero to 176. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we collapsed 880 things down to 176. Wouldn't okay. you really like to have each horizontal line represent a core, something in a, with a given hardware context? So that's a good point. Um, so there's a, a new version that we're working on that's in a branch where if, if you'll notice that in our current version, when you're looking at things, all you can see is really rank ID and thread ID, but it's not really correlated with the hardware in any way. And so there's, there's metadata there that's missing. And so in the new version that we have in our branch, we keep track of what your node ID was, what your GPU ID was, what your GPU stream was, instead of just saying, here's a GPU streamline, now you can understand that it was on this node, on this GPU, associated with this rank, you know, the following streamline, okay? So we have that, that metadata. So your comment about like it was on a node, and then for a CPU thread, we could say, it's on a node, it's on a core, and it's hardware thread two. And so we have that, that kind of metadata now. And then we're actually uh, going to show you that metadata. So if you select on a trace line right now, what you see is um, you'll see that I was on like rank six, thread four. We're gonna tell you that you were on such and such a node with such and such a, such and such a core and such and such a hardware thread ID, okay? So now if we were, if we were using the, that sort of hardware um, oriented view, then what we should see is all of the things that ran on core six should be on one line. So okay. it's a good observation. Okay. Um, let me see if I can pull up the example from Mark and then we can um, figure out how to use the rest of the day productively. Um, uh, if you want to try, I fixed the permission. So in my home directory on Cori, look for the one db-amg, uh, probably the OMPT is the one you want. I, I haven't looked at it in at least two or three years, but from the, from the way I named it, it sounds plausible. Uh, I, I'm expecting what this is, is that uh, this is AMG 2006 run with the uh, OpenMP uh, tools uh, library. Yep. Uh, run on Theta, of course. Yeah. So like, like Corey. Let me, let me, let me Yeah, you, uh, it probably comes with a trace. So you want to see if there's a yep. trace there. Yep, we'll look at that. So we'll do the trace first. I'm not using NX here. I'm just doing this directly on a virtual desktop at Rice. Um, so, Let's see what we have. So 
here, re remember I showed you with the with the trace that I collected on Corey that it was showing us that that this was in a barrier that this uh, AMG 2006 is very much like the AMG 2013. It's just the, the AMG 2013 is a little bit more modern version of it. And so in this case, what we see is it does tell us that all this green here is open MP threads that are idle. And so if you look um, a little closer, what you can see is that there are um, there are periods, the colors are, are really sort of bad. There's like low resolution between them. We assign colors randomly. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So what you can see is that for this brown computation, we're, we're offloading some OpenMP work to the worker threads. But then once that finishes, then while all the rest of this is going on, the OpenMP workers are just sitting there. They're not doing anything. And so if I, if I start looking at this application in sort of a top-down fashion, it's a little slow remotely. So I'll find that there's main. It's taking too long to render. Um, and then there's, now I'm moving down one level. And what we should see is that the, the computation is, is divided up into, there's setup, which is this green phase. And then there's, um, and then there's a solve phase, which is different. So, yeah, the, the interesting part of the data of this database would be in the solve phase, looking yeah, at so the, looking at the um, the load imbalance within each region. Right. So what I wanted to show is is right here. So if if you notice that there's this uh, AMG setup. It's drawing, drawing. And I'm looking for I'm looking for the level where we can see the difference between what code is is serial and what code is parallel. I should just zoom in and it'll be a little easier to see. And a little faster. Okay. So this is This is a case where we couldn't, uh, it was just slow. Okay. So here, I'm typing way ahead of user interface. Let me go back to the profile. Because this is, this is going to address what I think it was Steve was, was asking about. So what, what we had done in the, um, in the user interface was we had collected information about when you were idle. Um, we used the strategy where we would say, I'm idle and I don't know why. And so let me just increment a counter saying that my thread is idle. And then when other threads took samples and they were active, then they would say, well, I have to assume some blame, like how many of us are active and how many of us are idle? And I'm gonna take some blame for the idleness that's elsewhere. And so then what we're able to do is we're able to, to charge the idleness to places in, in the code. And so then we can say, well, why don't I, why don't I uh, take the program and then say, show me where the idleness occurs. And yes, when I demoed this at uh, Argon, what I demoed was the sort of the parallel efficiency of different OpenMP loops. Right, and so, all of the idleness, like a lot of the idleness is coming from this AMG Corson file group. And so if we actually look in the, if we look carefully in the trace and it's a little hard to do it interactively um, remotely, but what we would find is that in that setup phase that AMG Corson file group never calls any OpenMP stuff at all. And so what's happening then is there's a bunch of OpenMP worker threads that are idle and all of their idleness gets blamed on the serial code that's running in the other thread. 
So I think that this addresses the the issue that you had, Steve, which is like, you know, so there all this idle time, what am I going to do about it? And so by attributing the OpenMP idleness to the code that's actually running, we're identifying regions of serial code or regions of code that have there that are under parallelized, where um, where if you can add more parallelism to them there, then that would result in less idleness. And so that gives you some advice about where you should tune your code. And so then we're looking to integrate the support for this back into um, HPC Toolkit and the uh, LLVM OpenMP runtime. So the good thing about doing that is these days, Intel's generating code with the, with the LLVM runtime, um, AMD's generating code with the LLVM runtime. So if we fix it there, then it'll be good on the forthcoming exascale systems. And a lot of people use Clang anyway. So, okay, other questions? I have a question, it's, it's related to something I DM'd you. Um, do you guys have like a set of, like here are the best counters for looking at different things as opposed to here's a big list um, I don't because we've spent so much. So maybe if you look at that, uh, that thing that was linked in the slides that might have some advice about that. Mm -hmm. Um, we've spent so much time just trying to figure out how to get the data that we haven't focused on, on using it in, in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. So Intel and VTune, they, they did build this, uh, this, support for top-down analysis. So there's this whole, um, kind of a whole area. So this was started by Dave Leventhal called cycle accounting. And so he did some work on this for the Itanium architecture. And so there's a bunch of stuff that's available on the web about cycle accounting, where it's like looking at this top-down model where you, you're, you either are stalled and then you can ask, well, am I stalled in the front end or the back end, and if I'm stalled in the back end, is it the um, am I stalled like waiting for functional units, or am I waiting for the memory hierarchy? If I'm waiting for the memory hierarchy, then is it level one, level two, or level three? And um, either I'm am I executing instructions? Are the instructions graduating? Are they useful, or are they speculative and they're being squashed? And so this top-down analysis is is like a, a tree structured design for exactly what you should, the, the way that you should be looking at this. And so the, that whole um, approach is something that's very useful. And now Intel has codified this in VTune and they have uh, this, uh, this top-down analysis style available and there's support in it. And so um, we can look that up on, on the web. I think seeing that- Yeah, would, actually I would, sent you a picture of that in, your, in, in, the, in Slack. I was asking you exactly that. Like, is there something like that for, uh, for um, what do you call it? For HPC toolkit. For HPC toolkit. So, so right now we we don't have um, support for top down analysis. So what I can say is, a few years ago we were looking to build this, and then it became clear that ninety five percent of the cycles were on the GPU, and so we just like stopped working on the CPU side, and began to focus almost exclusively on monitoring and analyzing GPU performance. Mm -hmm. I think you can understand why. Yep. Okay, um, any other questions? Or um, I was thinking that maybe, is Willem on? No. John, a few questions uh, I have. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. What about the open act kernels? Is there any specific things that needs to be considered for the open act applications? You mentioned uh, about the OpenMP tools interface and you know uh, some of the caveats or challenges there. Is there anything specific uh, for the open act? So this is actually a, a code that um, we were working on with uh, Willem Fan who uh, was working on Summit. And so I worked with them some on, on Wednesday and we, we got pretty far. So let me show you what, what we collected. 
So this is a this is a, an open ACC program, and this was running on. Um, oh, I'm not sure. I guess it, it ran from uh, 36 ranks, and um, and then it had uh, a couple of a couple of CPU threads and a couple of GPU streams um, within a process. And so if we look at what's going on in in a process, I think this is this is the main thread, and then this is a progress engine thread. Um, I could see thread group calls progress engine. And then the next one says, here's another progress engine calling polling. And so that is thread two and thread three. So the progress engine threads are not of interest. So I'm just going to filter out thread two and thread three. So I'll just say in the filter menu, thread two, don't show them. Thread three, don't show them. And now we're looking at the main rank, and then there's some some open MP. Uh, well, no, I guess some sort of slave threads. I don't know what they are. Um, and they're launching some things. And then we have um, GPU kernel operations, and we can find out. Well, they're they're very short. We find out what they are and the full call path where they came from. So this is a Fortran code and it's coming through OpenACC and in invoking these uh, these kernels, okay? So what I wanted to show you back in the profile is you, you asked about, uh, this is still flash, let's see. Close database, I've got two things open here. Okay, so now we're just down to um, his OpenACC code. So if we look at where it, it spent its time and we'll ask where the GPU oper where it where it was executing GPU operations. So So wait, isn't most of the time spent in thread root, not in program root? Yeah, it it, it is. And and so the, the reason for that is just the thing that I was that I was talking about where um, we have open ACC slave oh, stuff yeah. the same way, right? And so um, I would argue that like this is an uncomfortable way to analyze your performance. So we're probably better off in in the bottom up view. Yeah, and I, I've noticed that open ACC spins pretty hard when when you're uh, waiting for the GPU kernel. It's not it's not yep. light on the CPU. So I was looking to see. Um, what I had done here. So actually what, what, what you're seeing is a version of this code where I had applied some filters. So let HPC do a refresh here. So if I, if I look and, and look for where the, sorry, I'm clicking around so much. I'm looking for where the GPU operations are called. Then um, what I what I see is all of this stuff where we're going through the open ACC launch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, PGI UACC launch, CUDA launch, CUDA launch three. You say all this stuff, like I just don't want to see it. It like doesn't add any value to what I'm mm -hmm. looking at. And then um, I also we also noticed that there were there were some places where um, unknown, like there were, here, here we go, like unknown file, the basic C device. They, they've got like some stripped, some stripped functions. In here. Mm -hmm. And, and so, um, we, we went and just put some filters in and said, anytime you see PGI UACC, just hide that function. So basically any cost that is incurred here, just attribute it to its caller. And so by, by saying, star PGI UACC star, it's just going to collapse all of these out. And so if you look at this, is mod gen meg something calls some open ACC things called GPU kernel. Yep. Now, when I turn on the filter and I go back into the same place, I'm going to sort by the right metric to find the same place. Um, that, this is where we were. Now it just it looks like it calls GPU kernel directly, and you get to see the the open ACC kernels 
and we've we've hidden all the the PGI library cruft. Yeah, that's helpful. Okay, and I notice that there's some stuff down here. Um, well, I, I have a question though. Like, if you're accidentally, or not, I shouldn't say accidentally. If you're sending data that you shouldn't be sending to the GPU because it's already there, won't you hide all of that stuff that's going on when you do this, oh, and no. and then you're not? No, because like here, so here's copy in, okay, and so we we have we have put in these specific tags like copy in GPU sync, um, GPU kernel. And so these are synthetic tags that we put in. So you don't end up just sort of showing up somewhere in an open ACC library where if, if I hid those things, then they, they would just get swallowed. And so we, we attribute things to these uh, synthetic tags. Okay, so copies get attributed to, to the tag. Now, where did this copy come from? Well, there's no line information right in front of it. That means that it must have come from, from this right here. So it's, uh, I think, let's, let's look up in the code a little bit. Uh, well, let me not hide things and see if it looks different. So we have the uh, kernel launches at the bottom of this call chain. Um, right, and what you don't see uh, here is is that oh, uh, is that PGI is looking inside that loop possibly in. Well, you do have a copy in there, but it will it will put implicit copies in if it, if you don't say anything. Actually, so this is a very good point. Notice that there actually is a useful line number where this PGI UACC launch is called, mm -hmm. and so if we swallow this line, then we lose this line number. Yeah. So rather than blindly filtering out all of this stuff, I could say this one is useful, but I don't care about this one, and I don't care about this one. So I could write a slightly more sensitive filter that um, they have the leaving. same they have the same name uh, no this is UACC CUDA launch oh CUDA of, I see yeah 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 okay. so if I just edit this and say um, I want to filter UACC CUDA instead of just all UACC stuff It's annoying that we uh, will write this down as a bug report that it's like losing the settings. So I, I was originally selected here. This was originally selected as my sorted column and that selection disappears when I apply the filter. Um, so we should get that back. So here, um, did I not specify this right? No, I think the, those were not applied. I think filters were not applied. Uh, I think you're right. I keep reselecting the same thing, I'm getting ready to file a GitHub bug report. <laughs> Nothing like eating your own dog food, right? Um, okay, so then now we're, we're, we're actually tying the kernel launches back to OpenACC directives. And then the copies also should be tied somewhere. So if I want to go find the copies, let me look in the bottom up view and sort by copies. Find out where I spent my time copying. And then this tells me my copy outs were coming from, uh, it says copy in. Oh, we've got a, something wrong there. Yeah, it, it's probably implicit. Yeah. Right, so there might be there might be implicit copy out. 
If you compile with dash M Excel, it'll tell you for every loop where it's implicitly doing things. But yeah, if PGI won't throw an error, it'll just say, oh, you must need to copy this out. So I'll do it for you. I see. Well, um, so what I can tell you is that we haven't spent a lot of time looking at, like the first time we actually looked at OpenACC was Saturday. So this is basically like what you get if you don't pay any attention to open ACC at all um, in HPC toolkit. So uh, is it possible that we have the, the wrong tags on here? I think we would have to write a little benchmark program that was copying in and copying out. And so we knew exactly what was there and we could validate the tags. It, it seems mm -hmm. plausible that what we're showing, but I can't guarantee it. What, what I can say is that anytime we're saying either copy in or copy out, it definitely is data movement. But, um, and I think that it's the right directions. It's just that I'm a little bit unsure here because we do see copy in sure. directions and we're measuring things that say copy you're, out. You're, the rest of the trace looks like you're doing it right because you see how it says ACC downloads and ACC uploads. It's doing the right thing. It's just that it's, there's no line in the code that says copy out because it's implicit. I see. Okay. Uh, John, another question here. Uh, so uh, along with the program root, we have the thread root or uh, something about the thread. So in case of the open act, it's, it's the open act uh, threads, is it? it? There is no open MP involved here, right? I, I think that these are, are open act threads. Uh, uh, let's see. I meant yeah. the thread root, uh, the third yeah. one. This yeah. is a partial. Yeah, I wasn't paying attention to what I'm clicking on. Uh, so, create slave threads from NVOMP. That's maybe. I, I think that's actually NVIDIA stuff, like the, the lower level. It's not even ACC. Um, if that is the case, ah, okay. So then out of 100% of the application time, only 17% is actually just in the code, is it? How? Well, so so remember, the reason why I gave this talk this morning was I said, we're looking at profiles, beware of real time in the profiles, because mm -hmm. these are in progress engines. They may be just sitting completely idle, right? Just sitting yep. there waiting for some event to happen. And we're repeatedly saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And we see that they're inside the progress engine. If we measured using CPU time or measured using cycles, then that would give us a more accurate um, assessment of what's going on. So what it, it, it may be that just having these threads sit there, it's not helping you, but it may not be hurting you either. Now, mm -hmm. it may be the case that when you provision it for say, JS run, if these things are running hard, then maybe you need a core for them. But if we measured it using CPU time and we found that actually they're spending all of their time blocked, then maybe we don't need to dedicate a core to them. And we would use the course for something else, like you know, pack in more ranks or, or something. Yeah, my, my experience is that that one core runs runs hot and the rest of the threads are idle. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we should be able to see that by by running it again and, and measuring it with something different. So um, this result that uh, we got with Willem is a bit of a cautionary tale. So first of all, we launched it and it got stuck in, and the way it got stuck was um, there's a, for historical reasons, there's an option that has to be passed to IBM Spectrum MPI that says, um, disa PAMI disable CUDA hook. They, um, they're, trying to understand when memory is being allocated on NVIDIA GPUs and NVIDIA refused to put in a callback interface that would notify them of that so that they could just have Spectrum MPI just register for a callback. Um, so instead what they did was they decided that they were going to do some violence inside the runtime. And if NVIDIA wouldn't tell them, they were just gonna take the information. So. NVIDIA will find their functions like Kudamalik by 
opening NVIDIA's library and then doing a DL sim to find the function that's the find a, a pointer to the function that has the appropriate name. And so what IBM said is, well, we're going to override this DL sim function. And anytime anyone goes to look for a symbol in any shared library, we're going to check to see if they're looking for CUDA mallet. And if it is, then we'll know what that symbol is. And then we're going to wrap it so that we can watch the mallets. So it turns out what they did will lock up just about every tool. And so we knew this in 2017 and we had a better solution for them. And I thought that the, the better solution was what they ultimately deployed. And I come to find out now monitoring things on Summit that nope, it's left in the same state it was in 2017. And so you have to give it this disable PAMI could hook thing because they put something in their runtime that's basically um, kryptonite for tools. Um, tools have to use DL SIM, and if they override DL SIM, then it, it causes trouble. So that was item one. We, we when we ran, we found out that it is program deadlocked, and we had we had to attach a debugger, and then saw it was deadlocking in um, in this uh, libpami CUDA hook um, library that IBM has, and we remembered that oh, actually we have to turn that thing off, and so we added that option. And then the second thing that happened was it, um, it collected all the information and it made it all the way to Fortran stop at the end of the program. And then at the end of the program, we said um, cup de flush all, which was saying, asking NVIDIA's CUDA profiling tools interface to flush all of the activities out of the GPU. And that call never returned. And so the job timed out. And it turned out that we had collected all the data and written it all down, except that the job never um, the job never completed because this uh, call that we made to NVIDIA's GPU infrastructure just never returned. Now, maybe there's something that our tool did, like there's some interaction between the tool and NVIDIA's infrastructure that caused it not to return. I don't know. Um, Obviously, it seems like there must be something, but we don't know what that interaction is, and we don't know how to fix it. And so we'll have to work with NVIDIA to try and track that down. We tried to get a reproducer for it, but we don't have a, a simple reproducer. Right now, what we have is the, the whole application. So um, a good solution for us to use is if we say flush the data out of the GPU, and the GPU doesn't respond in 10 seconds, then we should say, okay, fine, I give up. Let me just record the profile data we've got and go home instead of, instead of expecting that it will terminate normally. So I think we could be a little bit more defensive inside our, our, our tools. All right. One last um, question I have. Oops. Yeah. So if I can ask one last question about uh, the, the user interface and in terms of the color mapping, so in one of your slide, you have that uh, climate model and there was like IO routines were called. Let's say there is a one, the ocean IO routine and there is, uh, I don't know, like the, uh, the earth IO routine and it's calling HDF5. And then I want yep. to map basically everything from ocean IO with the one color and the earth IO to be one color independent, there are multiple, you know, the stack frames. I don't want to see those stack frames, but I just want to have one. Is it possible? Um, I think that it would, that currently with the, the filters that we have, it would not be possible to do exactly what you want to do. So this is actually something that is under discussion because we're looking at um, what kinds of enhancements we'd like to make to this. So right now, the, the way that one writes these, these filters um, is, is one writes, uh, say, something about um, a procedure name, okay? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, here's a, here's a name for the, the, the procedure itself. So there's no way to actually like look at context like you were saying, like, you know, mm -hmm. to say, you know, for the atmosphere phase versus the ocean phase, when I do IO, I want to color it one way or another. We also discussed um, maybe you want to be able to say, if you're in the following load module, then like say you're in the MPI library, like you're in, in libmpi.so, I just want to color all that stuff red. 
you know, mm -hmm. that would be useful. Another thing that we thought was um, if your code came from the following file or from the following path. So for instance, uh, using, using say the Raja template-based programming model, you may include the templates all over the place. And so the Raja code is kind of scattered all throughout your code. And you might wanna just highlight anything where it came from the file star Raja star, you know, where Raja appears somewhere in its path um, that, you know, maybe you wanna color all that stuff one color. So um, I'll, I'll take as a, as a note that you would like to have some way to apply colors to things based on context. I think that that's a good suggestion. Yeah, that will be very helpful because I'm wondering this for quite some time. And a classic example is, let's say we have the IO and typically it, when the process are waiting, we see, for example, GPFS no cancel and stuff, which is waiting for the IO. But, uh, and I want to drive the timeline. I want to see what's going on. Uh, and uh, if I change the depth, I basically get more and more from GPFS, which I'm not interested in, you know, like the lot of things. So depending upon the IO phase, I just want to make something black or red. And I just want to, you know, understand that will be very helpful. Right. So one thing that you could do, so, so based on the, the filters here, there's a, a couple of ways that you can filter things. So um, when I add a filter, I can, set, I can write in a pattern and say, I want to filter out things of this name. So that's what we did with the PGI UACC CUDA launch, okay? And said, don't show this name, just put the cost into the parent. So that's filtering out yourself. But you can also filter out um, descendants only. So for instance, if I say MPI send, and then say filter out descendants only, then, then all the cost of M MPI send will just get sort of folded upward into MPI send. Okay. Does this metric get applied to the trace in the same way? For example, in the profile, this is applied. Is it possible to have this in a trace that will achieve the same purpose that we just discussed, I think? That's an excellent question. And I don't know the answer because this integrated user interface it just got released in, in March. Laxano, are you on? Yes. Well, okay. do the, kind do of. The, do the filters apply to the trace? Yes. If um, you apply the, uh, the filter on the uh, profile view and then you move to the trace view, it will apply to the trace view. So the colors, I expect to see the same color now as the parent to the, all the descendants? Yes, it, but th there is some issue right now. So if you already open the trace view and then filter the tree, then it doesn't affect. But if, but if you haven't opened the trace view, just in the profile view, it will apply to the trace view when you open the trace view. So okay. when, when, right, right. So what you're saying is if, 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 you, if you don't touch the trace view and you put in the filters or you always leave the filters so that they're turned on, then when mm -hmm. you go to the trace view, the filters will be applied. Okay. So now just have the, to switch the Right. So the, so the question that, that you were asking is if you have like A calls, B calls, C, and I want to apply the filter that says roll that whole thing up and just report it as, as A, in the trace view, then you won't ever see B and C. It's not going to. It's not going to color them the same. If you're using the filtering, it just it it'll, it'll just make them disappear, and it'll only mm -hmm. show the parent. Okay, mm -hmm. and yeah. and so sometimes that's useful. So like in the in the case where I just showed with the PGI um, ACC, you may never care about that frame PGI UACC CUDA launch, and so like just don't show it to me. It's 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 you know useless. In the other cases, you know maybe you want to apply colors to things and still show them. So I have cases where um, for the AMG um, code where I could say, well, um, if we can see that you're inside the uh, Intel runtime, like I, I match star KMP star. And, and so the Intel runtime routines are all named KMP. I say match star KMP and star and just color that yellow. And then 
Um, I can see some other things at the bottom that are like, well, so I was calling into barriers, but then at the bottom, like barriers calling sked yield or something, I say color that yellow too. And so then all of the things that I consider like, you know, sort of wasteful waiting can get colored the same thing. And then, and then treat it as an equivalence class when I look in the statistics view. So I think in trace view, uh, would still like to uh, see the call stack, you know, when I click through the trace, but at least yeah. if there will be a way to just color them with the same way, that will, that will help. You. Thank you. So, so certainly you could color them the same way by, well, like right now, you, your colors are independent of context. So for instance, if you did read, you could say, I just want to color reads blue. Okay. But mm -hmm. then then that would be true whether you're doing the reads from ocean or from atmosphere. Um, if you wanted to have context sensitive colors, then we could have something where maybe in the view filter, we could say, well, not only do you match a name, but maybe you, you match a caller's name as well, you know, sort of mm -hmm. if you, to do some context sensitive. Okay. Okay, um, I I feel like I've talked too much already. I mean, I'm, I know I'm answering questions. I'm happy to answer questions all day, but um, I would like to see if we can get some some people some people's code working. That's what my colleagues are here for. So, um, does anybody have any you know ex experiences one way or the other where they were either successful or they would like to report that they they failed? Um, and they, they need some help to see if we can move forward. So um, this is Rishi. I've, I've gotten HPC Toolkit to work. Um, I, I, I'm, right now I'm able to see more from Insight than I can from HPC Toolkit, but I think that's just because of my naivety and how to read what's going on in HPC Toolkit in general. That's been my experience I so far. Okay, um, I think that maybe um, let's see who here. Who is here on my team? I can't see my Zoom window. Um, if Karen is here, is Karen here? Dayon, Dayon is here. Uh, yes, I am. Ah, Karen. So maybe you can take a a look with Rishi at like what he finds out with Insight and, and then if, if there are some things that we can find out with Insight that we can't find out with HPC Toolkit, then we can take that as a, a note on something that we ought to look at. I, I know that for instance, Rishi, like we don't compute um, things like roofline models. I, I mentioned that that's a piece of, of future work. So that's clearly a place where um, there's some things that you can get from Insight that you can't get from HPC Toolkit yet. If I may ask one other thing that um, the NVIDIA tools have tried to do, and it wasn't clear to me whether you're tracking it, was uh, unified memory movement. Ah, so unified memory is is an interesting case. So if you take a, a page fault on the CPU side, then we should be able to see that, that cost of the page fault. And I guess the, um, I guess the unified memory can be attributed there. But what Karen and I found was that for the, the GPU, the records in CUPT did not have an indication of who caused the page fault. I think they just gave us the address that the fault was on. And so I don't think that there was a clear way to map it back to the code. Max, I see that Max is on. Do you know if, if that's something that, that's been adjusted in the later models of Cupti or whether they're still lacking a, a way to attribute unified memory faults back to the code on the GPU? Or Karen, if you know this, I know that you've looked at this some, but I, I don't know that we've looked at this recently. I don't think so. I don't think we can do anything on the GPU side. Yeah, that, that's my recollection. So 
I think that um, we, we're, Constantinos, I, th I think that we're missing a critical piece of measurement infrastructure to be able to map that back to the GPU code to understand when we're causing um, page faults and data movement. Now, the, the other thing that we could do, and so this is also sort of a coming attraction though, um, is that if we're using the NVLink counters, then we should be able to see that there's like, see the volume of data movement, but it's, again, if it's, if we can't attribute it back to the code, then it's, uh, it's a little harder. Um, if there are serialized kernel launches and we read the counters before the kernel launch and then after the kernel is finished, then we should be able to see data movement that was caused by the kernel. And, and that, would, uh, that would show up as regardless of whether it was unified memory data movement or otherwise. So, but we do not yet have um, the GPU counters um, completely wired into HPC Toolkit. We're, we're waiting, we're working with the PAPI team to uh, address some issues uh, before we can wire it in in a way that we can release. Okay. Thank you. John, this uh, unified memory transfer, though, those were shown on the trace view or not? I think that they should be shown on the trace view. Do you know? No, we don't. Uh, we don't show that at this moment. Okay. Because I think and if they are not mapped to the source code is fine, but at least, you know, as an application developer, I know at this particular time, you know, what possibly causing. So if they appear on the trace view, that's at least, you know, something useful already. Okay. Uh, we should take a note uh, about that because we could certainly show them on the trace view. I think that when we get the records, um, I, don't, I would have to look at the, the cupd.h file to make sure that the records actually have times in them. But as long as they yes. have, okay, they, they do have times in them. So in that case, then we could make them visible on the trace view. And that would seem like just a few minutes worth of work um, to just say it's another, another set of things that we're tracing. I think at the moment, we probably just have the unified memory events turned off. And as a continuation of that, um, to the degree that in the future things will be done using um, HMM in the Linux kernel, do you expect to, to have more flexibility in figuring things out or you will have to rediscover things from scratch and uh, uh, possibly run into similar problems? Because I'd like to see, for example, with other types of GPUs that may be using that mechanism for unified memory how we can get similar information. So uh, what I would have to say is that um, at, at the moment, we haven't, we haven't put too much effort into the tracking of unified memory because first of all, for, um, for CUPT, it didn't have any way of, of attributing it back to code. And so that made it of less interest for the, the profile view. And then second, um, we've been waiting for GPUs from the other vendors who have implementations that, that supported unified memory. Um, my understanding is that the release GPUs from AMD do not, although they promised it for, um, for say Frontier. So I, I, I think that the GPUs we have just don't support it. And so there's like no measurement mechanism for it either. Do you know something different? Am I mistaken? I, I know that there have been things that have been uh, put in the Linux kernel to support HMM, and uh, that's the mechanism that AMD has been putting in, um, like uh, okay, kernel Do you know? kernel patches for that. So I assume that's the mechanism that they're they're pushing. That's why I asked specifically about HMM because HMM, hopefully. Again, to the degree it gets adopted by more than one vendor, should be a mechanism to allow you to do things in an easier way. I know that NVIDIA at some point was also working with HMM, but I don't know what's their current planning. So, Xiaoju, could you just take a note of that, that we need to talk about this with AMD, about the HMM? So, um, to, to your knowledge, are there any AMD GPUs that support unified memory? 
my understanding is that the unified memory support works with uh, with power, um, but it doesn't work elsewhere. So that... let's clarify the two differences here. Uh, unified memory that's page-based works with pretty much everything in, in NVIDIA land. And again, to the degree that I've understood it, uh, the HMM mechanism is the AMD mechanism. And I have no idea exactly how USM is implemented for Intel, whether it's using something like that or they're going their own path. I, I wish everybody could use something that would make everybody else's life easier, but that I'm not certain. That would be page-based. The fine-grained one, uh, we are the only ones that implemented it. Uh, and that's what so we're until back. such a time that somebody else comes out, I presume uh, for Frontier, they may not want to take a step back from Summit and have something equivalent, but I don't know what their mechanism is. We're the only ones that have that. Um, but basic information that's page-based hopefully can be gotten anywhere. Right, and, and so what? If if I if I recall correctly, then it, it's the the CAPI interface is the thing that that implements that, right? It it makes the accelerator. It has a well. A so no, that, that the, the the CAPI and then open CAPI stuff was a, a power specific mechanism for generic accelerators. But in fact, when we uh, collaborated with Nvidia for Summit. Uh, we did something specific with NVIDIA that was not copy based. Um, I see. So it's, there, there is an actual engine specifically for talking to NVIDIA GPUs on Power 9 uh, CPUs. So um, that was very designed specifically. It has its own protocols, its own way of uh, one way caching and, and things like that. So, um, I mean, if some tool could actually provide details on how things were done, that'd be great, but uh, that's a different story. Uh, I was asking more for something that would work everywhere right now. Uh, yeah, so I would say that this this clearly is something that needs some attention, and especially since everybody is moving to these more tightly integrated models. Um, I, I don't remember off the top of my head what the standards are, but I think that, um, I think there's something called CCX, perhaps? Um, so, yes, CCX was one effort to essentially uh, make um, the PCI bus allow coherent connection of accelerators. Um, I guess people call it CCX for some reason. Um, okay. And then uh, now CXL seems to be the big um, 100 pound gorilla out there and it supports in the CXL 2.0 standard uh, fully um, coherent uh, with accelerators, but there is no CXL 2.0 hardware out there. And um, it, because of its generality, it may actually offer less than what you get on Summit. I'm not certain. But what you got on Summit was something very specific to power CPUs and NVIDIA GPUs as opposed to a generic standard. While CXL so, uh, is going to be supported by everybody. So I, I guess um, my, my my impression was that there was one standard, like everybody's a member of everybody's standards committee, but I thought that there was one that was the, the horse that AMD was backing and then another one that was the horse that uh, Intel was backing. And so it sort of looked like everybody was gonna have their own standard, which is sort of less useful for us as just consumers of these things. Right, no, I, I can't speak for the, the other vendors, but my impression is that everybody is on the CXL bandwagon at this point, okay. but for more performance solutions, they may always implement their own thing because if you have your own CPU and your own GPU, you can always put hooks that are more specific. Um, it, to the degree that you can start tracking uh, cache coherence moves uh, between CPUs and GPUs, your tool would be like a dream. But I have no idea how much work that would be. At this point, I would simply be happy if I can use uh, HPC Toolkit and see um, unified memory or whatever it's going to be called implemented whichever way it gets implemented, maybe HMM, maybe some other way, but be able to see it even in the trace view, as was mentioned before, that's more helpful than not seeing it at all. 
right. obviously if there is a way to get attribution that's that's even better no question about it the reason that right. i'm saying that is that what we discovered on on the summit experiment so to speak is that the moment you start saying okay let me put more and more unified memory usage you discover sometimes that um you just stepped on a uh, in a trap because you introduced a lot yeah. more motion than you wanted to. So having a way to look at what you did and what caused the trouble would be great. And sorry for asking so, a lengthy question. <laughs> oh, this is, I mean, this is, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great question, but this is actually something that has to be addressed with the, the GPU vendors, because for instance, Nvidia has this PC sampling interface. And so what you can find out is that here's a, a an instruction that is stalled and um, there's nothing else that's <clears throat> that's runnable and so then we'll we'll log the stall reasons and it says i'm stalled on memory and so we don't know whether it's stalled waiting for something to come back from l2 cache or whether it's waiting for something to come back from from l3 cache so all we know is it's stalled on memory now on the CPU side, like on uh, with uh, AMD's um, instruction-based sampling and with, uh, say, Intel's load latency facility or, um, or with the power marked instructions, we can find out where you got your data from. And, and so that's something that we can measure. But on the GPUs, it basically just, like right now with NVIDIA, it says, you're waiting for memory. And so that isn't going to really tell you, um, you know, in detail, like where this data is moving from. Like, I think that that's what you want to know for this unified memory case. Right? Yes. And, and so what we need is something that's kind of like the equivalent of, of uh, Intel's load latency facility inside the GPU. And right now we have none of the GPU vendors supply anything like that. And, so if this is the problem that we, we want to measure, and this is the problem that application developers face, then we ought to advocate that the next generation GPUs has some, some mechanisms to support it. We've been just trying to fight a simpler problem, which is we just want some way to attribute things to instructions in the GPU. So, you know, I feel like we're halfway there if we can at least say we're stalled here, right? At least if we can say we're stalled on memory, that's part of it. We don't know which memory, but at least it's helpful instead of just saying the GPU kernel ran for the following number of seconds. Um, so we've been advocating with uh, all the GPU vendors that we want some support for fine grained measurement, and can't really say about um, you know what the status of that is. All I can say is that currently Nvidia is the only one that has support for PC sampling in in a released GPU. So it's helpful. An observer listening to this conversation go on, I'm I'm wondering if it would make sense to to present HPC toolkit or, or to present a mode of HPC toolkit where it's focused on drilling down into the internals of of what the kernel is doing or or what the um, the the backend um, underlying libraries behind the Rockham stack are are doing, rather than looking at the application. It, it seems like a totally different focus to try and to try and look at the end of the call stacks instead of the, you know, the top portions. Sure. So for, for instance, um, I, I don't know what set of slides it, 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 it's in. It's, it's not in the current set of slide, like I, it's probably a hidden slide in the current set of slides that, that I just showed, except that I could only find the PDF. So I don't, I don't have the hidden slides handy. What we showed was that using the kernel sampling um, on an earlier version of NVIDIA's infrastructure, we were actually able to show that um, you spent a lot of time clearing pages inside Cupkey. So, so that was showing the interaction between the, you know, the GPU software stack and the operating system. And we felt that that, that was helpful. And so then we turned around to NVIDIA and said, hey, you know, we noticed that a lot of your overhead is actually clearing pages. And then they went back and um, and took that information, and then their subsequent version of Cupti um, didn't do that. So um, so those sorts of insights into the the software stack can be useful. 
And I think that that perf is good about that. As long as we have kernel symbols, then we can actually use perf to see what the issues are with the GPU software stack and you know beyond the applications. Yeah, and maybe sooner or later there'll be an example where comparing those sorts of information across different systems um, to, to look at how their um, differences in HMM yep. perform, for example, would be, will emerge. Yes, yes, good point. Okay, any other questions or should we work on some code? <laughs>